Uh, good, good afternoon. I'm Alyssa Maru. I'm the public program coordinator at the uh, Commission on Arts and Humanities. And um, welcome to the Salon for Business in the Arts, Building Access to Public Art Placemaking. Um, today is a salon for all of us. So this is not a webinar, this is a salon, a, a conversation of education and resources being provided um, for artists, organizations, contractors, arts admins, um, everyone. So hopefully you will find your path to more information to public art access. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues today, Devon, who will be helping us with our tech materials, and Vanessa Ackham, who will be helping uh, read our questions out loud and be mo monitoring the, the, the chat room for us. Um, a couple of housekeeping. Um, obviously, you know that, that you're on mute. Uh, we'll be able to unmute you after the main presentation um, uh, ends. Um, you'll be, you, if you want to ask a question verbally, you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on you and unmute you so you can direct your question to uh, anybody in the in the room? Um, we uh, again, like, like Devon said, this session will, will be recorded and will be uh, shared on our website under the programs tab under the at CEH website. Um, if you are experiencing closed captions and want them turned off or want them turned on, the little uh, CC in a box in your lower left hand corner is for closed captions. You can turn it off or on there. Uh, if there's any follow up or questions and, and concerns, feel free to, to email me after the the, uh, the salon. I'll, I'll be providing my email uh, at the end of the of the panel. Um, so we can begin. Um, uh, as you can see today, we have a, a, a host of, of great. Um, resources and, and, and talent with us. Um, uh, we'll begin with uh, Corinne Miller, who is uh, the, the curator at the Golden Triangle. Um, we'll have a conversation with Amy Moore and Hannah Blumenfeld at CHA Workshop. Um, they have had a great experience uh, with uh, community community driven uh, workshops that um, that, that their nonprofit helps um, develop to, pub to be a, a public art project. Um, Candace Taylor, who is an individual artist, uh, will share her path as, as an individual artist uh, to be making to make and create public artworks. And uh, Christy Mieselman, who is from Cultural DC, uh, will be able to share how how she and, and her organization uh, bring spaces in, to, to, to arts, uh, so allowing creating a, a path for, for space uh, in, in, in bringing art art to art out. And then uh, lastly, we'll be joined by Bailey Edelson from JBG, a development firm, um, and she'll be able to give highlight and, and share opportunities that developers have and, and do and their interest and paths in public art place making. Um, we'll open the room up for uh, resource sharing, um, looking for you guys to, to um, share with, with each other and all of us opportunities that, that, that you feel um, or any challenges that, that, that you have to to, to, for public art, um, and we want your feedback and would love to hear it. Um, and then we'll have some, some Q&A. So if you have specific questions directed to any of our panelists or the commission, um, we look forward to, to having some, some of that Q&A. Um, so diving in to, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Devon. Um, so again, um, this is a, a, a conversation um, about public art. This is not um, just solely tied to the opportunity uh, for the, the PABC Public Art Building Communities Grant Program, which I manage. Um, so this is hopefully a, a pathway to access public art in, in, in many realms. However, um, we encourage you and, and, and invite you to consider applying for the, the PABC grant, which will be released um, in, in mid-March. And essentially the, the PABC uh, grant program looks for artists and nonprofit organizations uh, to design, fabricate, and install new works, uh, either temporary, so under two years, or permanent, uh, five years and above, um, to, to, to bring, to, to expand the public art portfolio for the district. Um, so we're going to begin uh, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Corinne Miller from the Golden Triangle. Um, 
Uh, and so Corinne, uh, I, I'm really happy to, to have Corinne's voice in this conversation. She is the only uh, curator on staff at, at, at a bid um, or Main Street in, in DC. So um, she's really done, done a, a lot of great projects um, under uh, the public art landscape. And um, uh, per Corinne's bio, uh, this is as the Golden Triangle this Improvement District Public Art Public Space Activation Coordinator, Corinne Miller devises and implements a year round public art program for DC's Central Business District. At the Golden Triangle, Corinne has led two large scale public art partnerships with the Smithsonian Institution, temporary and permanent public art projects, and related to public art programs. Corinne previously served as Arlington Arts Center's curator and director of exhibitions conceiving and delivering a year-round exhibition schedule and public programs for three distinct exhibition programs. Prior to that, Corinne spent more than a decade building relationships with the region's emerging and mid-career artists. Miller believes as gallery director for five years at, uh, at the Connor, uh, at Connor Contemporary before moving to Cultural DC's Flashpoint Gallery where she developed more than six years to collaborating with artists and leading their visual art programs. Um, she is a, a wealth of knowledge and, and has curated many exhibitions and um, is also an adjunct professor at George Mason University. So let's welcome Corinne to the conversation. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here just shortly. Um, so I, I joined the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District in 2017, as Alyssa mentioned, as their first ever curator. Um, but the bid had been doing public art projects um, for at least 10 years prior to me joining. So they had this really great history of doing projects in some of the metro stations, the parks, um, mostly permanent, mostly permanent projects. Um, and I've been able, in the three plus years that I've been with the bid, I've been able to do um, I think a really exciting, uh, exciting mix of um, temporary and permanent projects. Oh, uh, it looks like, um, are you all sharing for me? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. that's fine. Okay. Um, I can allow yeah. you to share if you uh, would like to. Here you go. Yeah, if it's, if it's just... easy, then I can just talk, I can just toggle through, thank you. Okay. Um, sorry. There we go. Got that? Yes, we see it. Thank you. Hey, okay, cool. So uh, we cover a 44 square block area um, that basically goes from the White House to just south of DuPont Circle, and then uh, basically 16th Street to uh, 20, 21st Street, so New Hampshire and Pennsylvania Avenue as well. Um, so as a business improvement district, we do all kinds of different things. Um, many of you are probably familiar with bids, but we do everything from like landscaping to clean streets programs, um, outdoor events, public space design, sustainability. Um, so it's basically like wraparound services for the neighborhood and public art is, is one component of that, that that I get to work on. Um, and so today I want to talk a little bit about uh, some programs that I've done in the last 10 months. It's actually been a very busy time period for us with, with public art. So a couple of projects are projects that were already in the works uh, pre-pandemic that we've been able to do. And then a couple of the projects that I'll show you are uh, projects that we've done in response to in, in response to the pandemic and also the um, econo economic downturn and social distancing and some of those uh, forces have come into play in our in our planning. Uh, so the first project that I want to share with you is a project that we launched uh, in October with the Smithsonian on their American Women's History Initiative. So we use Connecticut Avenue as we, we treat it as the spine of the neighborhood. It's a really important location for us to activate. So we did two, two projects in partnership with the Smithsonian on Connecticut Avenue, one with local artist Rani and Hassan, who you see on the left, uh, and the other with a New York-based artist Marin Hassinger that you see on the right. The project on the left is at Connecticut K, right by Farragut North Metro, and then the other pro project is on the Connecticut Avenue Overlook, just south of DuPont Circle. So these projects um, were in the works for probably uh, 
a year and a half prior to installing them. Um, so a pre-pandemic idea. And with Rania's work, we released a request for qualifications and ran a selection panel uh, and com commissioned a new work. It's the first large scale public artwork uh, that she's done, and and we're so uh, we're so proud to have it at, at Connecticut and K and some, some progress shots of uh, of it being fabricated. And the model um, that you see Rania holding is the model that she proposed the project to us uh, with. So it's nice to see it fully fully realized um, and and installed there. And then the other project that we did as part of the Smithsonian partnership is called. It's called Monument and it's by Marin Hassinger. It's a vol volunteer built project. So we work with volunteers to collect um, plant material, the sticks from uh, Kingman Island and Kenilworth Aquatic Garden. We did invasive plant removals to source the material and then worked with volunteers on site to, to help build the project. Uh, and it was it was tricky figuring out how to do it during a pandemic, but we were able to do it and social distance and make everyone feel comfortable. Um, and I think it was a really great experience for people to get out and, and build something. This is a project that we did um, also last October with Shama Kuver, a local artist. Um, the DC Department of Transportation had installed all of these concrete barriers along Farragut Park to allow for social distancing. It's a very busy area of the neighborhood and the sidewalks are also very narrow. Um, so this takes up a basically a parking lane along Farragut to allow for um, additional pedestrian space so people could social distance. The barriers weren't beautiful. Um, so we had this idea that we would, you know, I think a lot of people have done this recently, but to work with an artist um, to create a mural on the barriers. And then this is a project uh, by artist Foon Sham. Um, we received the Public Art Building Community Grant from the DC Commission to make this project a reality would not have been possible without them. And we installed four permanent Foon Sham sculptures in August and September of last year. And they're integrated into our rain gardens, um, which is a streetscape design project and a sustainability project that we have along, along 19th Street. It's now two blocks of rain gardens that we have. Um, so it helps make sure that uh, the water is clean as it re-enters our waterways after it rains. There's Alyssa, <laughs> um, and then uh, also a picture of uh, of install, so you can see a little bit of the the process behind it. So we're you know we're closing rain, roads and bringing in cranes and um, doing all kinds of fun uh, permitting and logistics. And then this is another project that we did in response to in response to the pandemic and the climate uh, called Windows. So we did an open call to artists to submit existing works. And then we worked with a, a commercial printer to install their works on windows of vacant uh, ground floor retails, retailers and restaurants. Uh, so it was a, we've had a lot of closures in the neighborhood, unfortunately, and this is a way to activate those spaces. So it's not just leasing signs everywhere. Um, and then also uh, following the, the, the protests around George Floyd's killing, uh, there were a lot of spaces that were boarded up. This is the Hay Adams that's at uh, 16th and H, basically right across from the White House. Um, so we worked with Adrienne Gaither to install her work there temporarily. Uh, and then these are two two other projects that we did as part of the windows. But we have um, we have installed eight out of nine artists so far. We see it as an ongoing program, uh, and I think there are six on view currently. And then finally, Alyssa wanted me to talk a little bit about our, our planning process and, and how we sort of get to get to these projects. So one of the first things that I did when I started at the Golden Triangle was to write a three to five year public art plan. And so I just wanted to talk, it's like a 20 page boring <laughs> internal document, but I just wanted to give a little bit of um, info on on sort of how we've how we've structured that and how we think about it. Um, so thinking about the big picture vision and goals, how it fits into the organization's entire strategic plan, um, thinking about what we've done to date, uh, and then thinking about like what what is the landscape of public art look like in the city? Um, how does this how does this fit into to and complement what other people are doing? 
um, thinking through who our audiences are, um, what, what they're interested in, key opportunities, how projects get implemented, maintenance. So if it's permanent work, we have to think through what the what the maintenance plan is, funding landscape partners, all, all that all that fun stuff. Um, so that's just a little bit of information structurally about how, how we think about the, the planning process. But we want it to fit in with what the Golden Triangle is doing um, sort of in general with other programs. And when there's an opportunity, we'll integrate it into other programs as well. And then the last thing I wanted to show is this um, tool that I developed as part of the public art plan. And this is not something that we're, you know, when we're like, oh, should we do this project? Let's pull out the strategic screen. But I think it's something that frames our discussions as we're trying to figure out what we're doing. So thinking about suitability to our overall mission, um, you know, how it fits into the strategic plan I already mentioned financial viability, um, staff capacity and our resources. I think, you know, this is like, you know, any new project, whether it's a public art project or not, are key things to um, to think through. So I'll stop there, Alyssa. Um, I don't want to go over my time, but I know you had I think you had a couple questions. I do. Thank you. And just for the for the for the room, we will be able to direct um, all of our questions to Corinne at the whole QA portion, but I have some for her that Hopefully, we'll shed some more knowledge and resources for, for all of you. Um, so, Corinne, I think people, and, and I, I know I would like to know, um, what are the first steps? Or actually, let me start. Let me start with, um, I guess, what what resources could other nonprofits, based main streets, organizations, if they don't have the funds to hire someone like you? expert in, in making public art happen, um, what can they do uh, as as for, for staff, staffing wise or as best practices or resources to, to develop a, a, a public art plan? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of things that you can do. Um, I think, you know, thinking through like what your actual capacity and budget is. And I think it's, it's, okay, it's, okay, it's okay to start small. Um, it's okay not to do a project every year, um, but you, and, and I think it's good to be strategic versus reactive. I think it's tempting when an opportunity comes up to just to try and do it, but I think sometimes it's good to step back um, and understand if it's a good if it's a good fit and makes sense. It's similar to any, you know, any new programming that you might that you might take on. Um, and I think backing up and thinking through like what why are you doing this? Like what what's the overall sort of vision that you have for a public art program? What are your goals? Um, and I think the the more you can, sometimes it can be really helpful to integrate projects into existing into existing programs. Like I showed that rain garden, the rain gardens project that we did. We do a lot of projects that are, you know, integrated into other initiatives, whether it's a streetscape design initiative or a sustainability initiative or about like the economic recovery, you know, with COVID. Uh, and then I think leveraging and partnerships is really important and getting getting good partners like a great a great partner can really help move along a project or program. But if you don't have the right partner, it's not going to it's not going to help you. Totally. I think we're going to get more partnerships a, a lot uh, today. <laughs> um, OK, one question I think that um, would be great is. Um, I guess what would be any advisable first steps for for building a budget for an individual project? Yeah, I mean one thing that the one thing that I would recommend in general um, is Americans for the Arts has a great public art network and they have like sample sample project budgets. They have info on funding resources. They have sample contracts. Like sometimes even just starting a project and figuring out like what is the contract you know, the, the sort of like seedy underbelly of public art, they can, they can help you through. Um, Cause it's not like, it's not the fun stuff to do and it's really hard and it can be, it can cost a lot of time and it can cost a lot of money. Um, so I recommend um, looking at their project budgets, but I think being really realistic when you're building out a budget, it can be really expensive to do public art. And I think doing your homework early rather than sort of guessing, like get actual estimates, um, le leverage partners for cost sharing, and then building contingency. Um, you know, 10 to 20% of your total project budget should be there in contingency because 
there's always stuff that can come up that, you know, that you can't really plan for. So plan for surprises. <laughs> Always time for surprises. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, Corinne, you've given us some, some great, great, great gem. Thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and resources. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, up next, we're going to have um, words from Amy Moore and Hannah Jacobson Blumenfeld, who have managed a public art um, uh experience uh, with, uh, with with CHA, uh, Capitol Hill Arts Workshop. They did a, a great um exhibition with a, a called An Alphabet Animals. And um, they uh, basically, I'll, they'll have the story, but but this is a, a, a community-based project driven that, um, that, that they helped res respond to the community by. So um, I will introduce Amy. Amy, um, Amy Moore has been with, uh, with, with CHA since uh, 2008, serving as director of education and programs until 2017, uh, when she assumed her current position as executive director. Her 30 plus years uh, in arts management uh, include serving as director of membership for Gay La Corps, operations manager for the Arlington Symphony and tour manager of the Polish National Radio Symphony. She holds degrees in elementary education, flute performance and music theory and history. Um, and her colleague, Hannah Jacobson Blumenfeld, um, who also facilitates, facilitates the, the project, um, is a Washington-based DC consultant whose work focuses on strengthening the capacity of mission-driven organizations to, to do their jobs well and to create the most social good. She brings a unique perspective from more than a decade of nonprofits, community building, and arts combined with tech startup experience, spanning a range of functions uh, as executive and project management to fundraising. Um, Hannah currently serves as the Community Engagement Manager for Creative Forces, uh, National Endowment for the Arts Military Healing Arts Network, and works, works extensively in the DC community with Capitol Hill Arts Workshop. Um, as Chief Development Officer um, with Serve Your City Award 6 Mutual Aid, and um, the 50 States Project and the M Alphabet Project. Um, Hannah has degrees in history from, um, from uh, history of art from Yale University. I'm going to uh, toss the experience and conversation to Amy and Hannah. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I am going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, great, can everyone see this? Looks like yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks so much for having us today. And I love following Corinne because uh, your your comments about partnerships really resonated. And uh, I am also going to start with a map. So uh, so we'll be aligned on that. And this is our map of the alphabet animals. Um, you can see there are two different kinds of uh, shapes here that show where our sculptures are. The grayed out bubbles here are the original 10 sculptures and the diamonds are the new sculptures. And that's really where I want to start because this is a two pronged project that spans almost a decade. Um, and it's a really special project for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that it really started within the community. Mm -hmm. So I want to go ahead and just a little bit uh, back to 2011 when one of our community members was walking with his two daughters and he was looking at the street signs with them and saying, E, E is for elephant. That's how you say that letter and C, C is for cat. And he thought, you know, that's a really fun idea. We should all have that. And the first thing he thought of was, let me take that to Cha, where he um, and his family took classes and were engaged as community members. And I think something that's really important about that is that he thought of this creative idea and then he knew where to bring it. And I think that's really key to this story is that Cha's been in the community since 1972. And it's a place where he knew that an idea would be uh, not just welcomed, but really celebrated and actionable. And of course, we love that idea at Cha. And this is 
uh, an image of one of our original animals uh, created by Carolina Mayorga, a longtime Cha teaching artist and artist in the community. Uh, and Amy's going to say a few more words about Cha specifically, but a few notes about the project that I just want to mention before we talk about Cha and also show uh, the sculptures from this last iteration of the project. Um, the first time that we did this project, we did it through a DDOT performance parking fund grant. So a little bit different of an avenue. And that's really where I wanted to start with this idea of partnerships that we were able to connect with the DC Department of Transportation. And really the whole project was formed and shaped uh, with that partnership in mind. We worked with them. They taught us so much about how to do this safely, how to get the right permits, how to ensure that the size and the shape and the weight and the amount of wind that can go through so that it doesn't hurt anyone. Um, they taught us that and in, in kind of in that uh, partnership and in that collaboration, we were able to connect with them about art. And it was one of the, the most special things about the whole project is getting to install with DDOT and to see the ownership that they take over being able to install these pieces and to be able to drive around town and say, I installed that, uh, that's a really special part of the project. And I think it's really key to how we think about community building through uh, this particular project. The second time that we did the project uh, was in the past couple of years. And I say couple of years because of course we had uh, the pandemic in the middle of when we were going to be uh, putting up the sculptures. And this time we did it with the commission. We did this through a public art building communities grant and in partnership with Eastern Market Main Street. And with those partnerships, uh, it was so key to this time because we were able to really work through how to get our work and to work with our artists to make sure that they were able to get their work safely to us and safely installed uh, even amidst the pandemic. So those partnerships were really key. And then just at the core of all of this and an important thread from 2011 all the way to now is that these are really about the livability, walkability, neighborhood vibrancy um, and whimsy and joy that is for everyone. It's welcoming, it's intergenerational, and it's really connective tissue. Um, you can see on this map that we really tried to space them out so that they they form, I will admit, a very long walk. I have, uh, I have required a few family members, let's say invited a few family members to do it with me in the past, and it's quite a long walk, but it's really wonderful to be able to um, move through the neighborhood in this way with these almost wayfinding devices. Um, and so I am going to hand it over here to Amy to talk a little bit more. Uh, this was our naming ceremony for that grasshopper. Uh, to talk a little bit more about Cha before we show a few of the sculptures. Thanks, Hannah. Um, like uh, Hannah mentioned, we've been around for about 40 or 50 years. And um, in that time, we've really been a hub for the meaningful exchange of ideas through art making and community, uh, both inside uh, with, with performances and classes and workshops um, inside the building and, and outside of its walls. So this obviously falls into the outside of its walls category. Um, and the expansion of the Alphabet Animals uh, project speaks really directly to Cha's um, focus both on creative expression and the power of partnerships to uplift the arts. It uh, connects diverse groups of people, uh, supports local artists, it facilitates arts-driven community networks, and uh, really encourages the idea that art and community building are synergistic. And this project provides a really important point of entry for a variety of stakeholders to take ownership in that creative potential that's in their neighborhood and uh, you know, directly experience the connective power of the arts. Awesome. Um, well, I know we just have another couple of minutes and I, I want to make sure there's time for Alyssa's great questions. Um, but of course, I wanted to show the amazing art that, that our artists created. So um, 
as we're going through, I'll I'll just be flipping through fairly quickly. We've got some process photos as well as photos of the installed sculptures. And I want you to just notice as we're going through the different kinds of materials and the very different styles of these. I think it's really important um, and it's a major part of the project that we do have such different ones. Um, so this is the turtle by Brian Gillerin and Mimi Frank. Um, this was in process. Here are monkeys by Undine Broad uh, and in process. The penguin by Evan Reed. And I just love these, uh, this character so close up. Uh, a horseshoe crab by Sue Champany. She uses a lot of recycled material and you can see we've already seen metal, clay. Um, this is her first prototype made out of cereal boxes, aluminum flashing, all kinds of different materials uh, and the size when compared to a, a live human. And here, here she is bringing it. Uh, this was just pre pandemic, I uh, want to mention, um, bringing it to Cha to drop off with Amy. Uh, this is a honeybee by Maureen Smith and in process. Um, you can see lots of different kinds of studios as well. A wood thrush wanders Washington, our, our local bird uh, by Charles Bergen. Sneaky cat by Davide Prete. This one's really fantastic. Uh, there are certain angles where you can barely see it at all, and then certain angles where it just really pops out like that, um, which is amazing. The awesome anteater by Beth Baldwin. And in process, and embellished neighbor, also known as our, our friendly aunt, a cousin of Chomper the Grasshopper by Carolina Mayorga. And uh, just so you know, this one is right across the street from the ant eater as a, a little art joke. Um, and here are some process photos of the ant, which I think are just really fantastic. And a photo of Carolina as she finds it in the wild. This is uh, the bunny by the artist team also Freon Gillerin and Mimi Frank, who also created our sparkly turtle right around the corner from Cha. And this is where you can visit the alphabet animals online. Uh, and we'd love to have you do that. There are maps, there are, uh, there's more information about the artists there uh, and more on each of the pieces. So I will stop there and uh, Alyssa, turn it back over to you. I can stop sharing so we can all see each other. All right. Thank you so much, Amy and Hannah. That was great. Um, I, I loved Amy's uh, message of, of, of synergy, artistic synergy. Um, and I think that will lead me to my my first question of um, which Amy actually posed to us as to why public art? How does it benefit you and your mission? Why public art? Well, I think uh, Hannah mentioned this in, in the beginning that the first round of animals really um, was just an idea from uh, a neighborhood uh, member and his kids and it, it you know it had an educational component to it obviously but it was also um, part of a just a general neighborhood beautification i think the second installation um especially during a pandemic provides um, not just an outlet for people it goes a little bit deeper into things that cohere a community and um like i said we were partnering with the eastern market main street with the goal of supporting uh, the business di district, um, which again, more uh, even more important in pandemic times. Um, so uh, I think it's it's multifaceted, uh, and you know it's something anybody can truly benefit from. It's uh, about as unobjectionable a, a public art project as you can as you can come up with. Yeah, we're all we're all receiving the benefits, and I, I think um, all the, all the partnerships are as well um, that you know really spans out and gets a, a lot of, of communities um, tied together through these partnerships, which is great. Um, next, I want to ask um, how, uh, in your opinion, how how can organizations best support artists' energy and in turn the needs of the community? Um, I, I I can take this, Hannah, if you want. Yeah, go for it. I think with anything that we do, um, 
just a basic operating premise is to let artists lead, um, be there to provide the financial logistical support for that creative freedom. Um, and I think it's really important to establish ongoing relationships with the artists so that you can, you know, truly look out for each other and develop projects together. So um, I think all of these artists were uh, uh, folks who had done uh, a, an animal in the first iteration of this project. And um, like Carolina, uh, the, the ant creator uh, teaches for us and has done other kinds of work um, outside of her teaching at Shaw. So uh, again, I, I think with the, it's, it's synergistic, you know, um, I think healthy relationships beget healthy relationships and uh, especially in a creative environment, uh, you know, the, the sky is kind of the limit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think letting artists lead is, is probably the most important thing you can do. I'm sure they would agree as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and how did you find your artists and um, how did you pose the, this theme in, in, in the call? So that's a great question. Uh, originally, we did do uh, an RFQ process. It wasn't an RFP because honestly, it was it was so new and it was so uh, much a collaborative process with our artists with DDOT that we didn't really want folks to feel like they had to create something in advance. So we did an RFQ, we had a juried panel um, of a few different members of the arts community, including a curator and artist and uh, selected the 10 artists based on that. And then for this second version, because we did need to uh, do actual proposals for the PABC grant, it was just a little bit of a different uh, framework. We went back to see if these artists would be interested in doing them again. And nine out of 10 of them did want to do it again. And we had one new artist come in. But uh, again, because of the partnerships that we had um, developed and to Amy's point, the relationships with the artists and also the relationship with DDOT that everyone felt like they really knew, okay, I know what kinds of materials might work. I know how to make sure this lasts for seven years. I know how to make sure the weight works with the signs. Um, we were able to do proposals, so they all uh, drew their creations. Um, we have a little bit of a first come first serve process with handing out the street names, but it's always fun to, to have a conversation about, you know, who wants H for the, the horseshoe crab? The, the actual animal is totally up to them. We don't do any, uh, any suggestion on that. So it really brings out their creativity on that level too. Right, cool. Yeah, I'm sure everyone was like, G for my last name or something, <laughs> something like that, right? Yeah, All right, exactly. cool. Um, my, my, my last question will be, um, kind of circling back to partnerships. So are there any, unconventional partnerships or uh, partners that, that could have or would have driven the project in, in a different way? Is there anyone that, that you think that would have, have you know, in, in, in looking forward to whatever you guys do next? Um, are there any partnerships that are possibly unconventional that you are looking to, to, to work with? Well, I can take maybe the first second of that and then, <laughs> and then maybe pass it over to Amy to, to finish off. I think DDOT, I can't say enough how how much that partnership has led to a whole different way of thinking about our community, of thinking about where art goes and who is a part of that creation, because I consider DDOT to be at, at least as much of a partner as as anyone in this. Um, and and I as I mentioned, I think I've probably said plenty about it, but really that the the teaching and the relationship went both ways. And part of why that worked is because everyone came to the table with a lot of best intention and a lot of belief that the other had something both to share and to learn. And I think that's how Cha often works with partnerships. So I don't know that I even know who it would be, but Amy, maybe I'll pass it to you to, to close this one out about how partnerships work at Cha. <clears throat> well, I would agree with you. I think they have to be organic, really, to be successful. Um, and uh, what Karen, Corinne was saying about the um, 
having good partners really, really matters, um, especially when you're dealing with that seedy underbelly of public art. Um, but I, I do think when you've got something that people uh, feel invested in, they've got an ownership over, you're gonna get a better result no matter what. Um, I would personally love to see if we did this again, um, not just finish off the alphabet since we've only got 20 letters, uh, we, we have more to go, um, but to expand, you know, if we did it in other parts of the city, I would be really interested to see who um, potentially would feel ownership of something like this and how that might, um, I think, being open to, to, to changing the project to meet the needs of that community um, and to develop, you know, ancillary programming around, around again, the needs of that community and the interest of them. So, um, yeah, I think that that kind of answers the question. You absolutely did. Thank you, thank you both for, for sharing everything and um, your great project and and your uh, and your responses. And thank you so much. Um, we yeah. are going to lead into our next friend, uh, Candace Taylor, who is an, an uh, independent artist. Um, and so, Candace Taylor is a creative director and public artist whose work focuses on cultural art development, digital media production, and community building. Before becoming a full-time artist, she spent over 10 years building a successful career as a graphic designer, artistic director, and team manager in a nonprofit government and private sectors. She's also the, the co-founder of Creative Junk Food, a multimedia studio focused on brand strategy, story-driven animation, and digital video production. She prides herself on being well-versed in multiple artistic disciplines and is cultivating a creative space where these endeavors can coexist. So welcome, Candice. Um, hello, everybody. Um, let me share this screen. All right. So yes, um, my name is uh, Candice Taylor. Uh, thanks for you know having me here today. I'm here to share a bit of my experience uh, as an individual artist uh, navigating the public art space. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, grants versus private commissions. Uh, and since I've actually worked with the commission on projects in a few different ways, I'll touch on you know some of those areas and mention. Uh, you know, some ways where I think, uh, you know, more could be done to really see through some of the outcomes uh, when it comes to placemaking projects. And, you know, as we think of uh, community engagement. So, so yes, um, this, was, uh, this was a project I did through a PABC grant uh, with the commission. Uh, this mural is called uh, A Community of Family. It's located in uh, Ward 7. And uh, this uh, project was um, founded around the idea of doing this mural as well as hosting the event. Uh, and this project took probably about four years to make happen. Uh, I grew up a uh, block away from the space. Uh, I knew the owner of the previous business. Uh, it's currently a hair salon owned by uh, Justina Wilkins Jordan. And uh, meeting her and getting to kind of come together with her, uh, she's very active in terms of community organizing. And, you know, she wanted her business to, um, you know, be reflective of her ideas around uh, community building and, uh, you know, a safe haven, host meetings and, you know, just a space for community to happen. And so then partnering that idea uh, with, uh, a mural made sense. So, uh, and this was, uh, this is wasn't the first uh, project I did with commission, but it was probably the largest and certainly the most challenging. Uh, and this was, you know, through the open process. Uh, this was most challenging, I think, for me as an artist, um, because of all of the the moving parts that uh, that type of uh, grant commanded, and it, you know, kind of just took me out of my comfort zone. It felt less like I was proposing. Uh, my art and ideas and more like I was proposing like to alter the city. Uh, and I think that that could be really daunting, uh, having to, you know, connect with property owners, uh, the civic leaders, the community members, uh, get all this buy-in and figure out, you know, then, you know, the who, what, when, how to get it done. 
and then also just, you know, be that free and creative. And it took me probably about a year to apply for this grant just because I needed that much time to get all of those uh, pieces together. So um, I think what uh, helped me was, you know, just being a business owner and having an idea of, you know, management and, and that um, aspect. But in terms of uh, getting it uh, installed, uh, another big piece of this one was uh, the community, uh, the event. and you know, at that event, we were able to have uh, vendors, we had local makers, we had uh, like uh, city services out just to kind of give people information. Uh, we had activities for the adults, activities for the kids. It was just really uh, a chance for people in the neighborhood to see it differently because um, there's really no art, other art like around it or near it. And uh, that area, that neighborhood hadn't really been engaged in a very long time. Uh, this uh, was a uh, was part of the latest uh, project I've done um, in working with the commission, and this is more like a, a direct commission. Uh, and I just had to, you know, um, this was uh, nice um, as an artist because I just had to, you know, come up with my idea and then be able to execute it within the given amount of time. And I think that. Uh, it was just really nice to uh, get the call and, you know, also there's two other pieces on this wall. So I got to work really closely with other artists, which I think is uh, something uh, a lot of the projects like working like that closely and being able to talk and mentor each other. Uh, I think there uh, could be you know, more of that done in, with projects in terms of those collaborative uh, opportunities. Uh, but uh, the thing, you know, even and then thinking about engagement with this. Uh, this is located in Anacostia uh, off of uh, MLK. So I had to think about, uh, you know, it being more than a history piece. Yes, it's about uh, women's suffrage, but uh, I wanted it to be uh, also about kind of forward thinking and to really reflect the idea of progress. So, um, and thinking about the culture of that location, that was important in terms of, you know, making sure that Peach would, was, you know, would be something that uh, the community around it would want to engage with. Uh, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about it, uh, especially, uh, and it feels, you know, really good, especially when it comes from like, uh, you know, little girls and, you know, feeling empowered. So I think uh, that's important. Uh, and this was nice, yeah, to uh, get to participate in a project like this that, yeah, let, allowed me to work with other artists and, uh, you know, just get to be an artist. I didn't have to, you know, worry about like with the PABC, there's a lot of permits. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, permission dealing with the agencies, dealing with, uh, you know, DCRA, getting, you know, all of the insurances and all those things in place. Uh, this one was a different experience because I just got to kind of show up and do the work. And this was actually the first piece I ever applied for uh, through the commission. And this was, uh, you know, a, a project based uh, commission. So apply for, you know, this and it's inside of the Department of Correction. So it's a, you know, sensitive location. Uh, but with this piece, it was important to be able to, you know, respond to the concept, uh, which was, you know, visual enhancement, making it less severe for like inmates and staff trying to help, you know, make it feel more humane, reduce uh, recidivism, uh, things like that. And this one, uh, you know, challenged me to, you know, do the task and, you know, manage the budget and uh, plan for all of those things, but I still didn't have to worry about like the location and sort of kind of finding the space. I think one of the biggest challenges as an artist is finding the space. And so uh, with this project, uh, not having to do that, but you know, everything else in terms of the ideation and all, uh, this was, I feel like the sweet spot in terms of my experiences with the commission, I did appreciate having to apply and having to propose my art and defend that and, uh, you know, go through uh, that grant, that selection process. And I think that is important, but uh, I think probably the largest uh, hindrance for artists is access to space. And uh, these are just a few of the, uh, when I say private commission, these are just, these aren't you know, necessarily grant funded. So uh, a little bit less restrictive in terms of what we could do and how we, you know, we could, uh, 
uh, you know, use the funds and, you know, what the project could entail. And uh, what I'll say about this is, uh, you know, for even for each of these example projects, they all have a community engagement goal still, um, you know, be that placemaking or culture, celebration, economic, um, what have you. And so it was still important to, you know, study the neighborhoods and understand the community, where the work was going, uh, know who the audience was, and, you know, make sure that whatever, you know, art we, we were putting out was, you know, is presented um, in a way that, you know, they feel, uh, you know, they feel heard and um, respected through. And then uh, a bit about uh, my creative process. So I won't, you know, get into all of these steps, but um, I'll say that in terms of, I think the most important steps are probably the idea and that because then location becomes uh, a place and, you know, understanding what the culture, the space, what it feels like, but then just having space to do it. And, you know, when you think of public artists, like I've shown a lot of mural examples, but it's certainly more than that. And um, I think that uh, and thinking about uh, placemaking specifically, like um, the having that quality of life improving aspect uh, to the projects um, or adding that layer to it, it also adds like a layer um, of, you know, I, I would say hindrance for artists, but it is just a layer of challenge for artists. And I think um, that that is a place where um, more support could be used in terms of helping artists navigate um, into this space. Uh, but yeah, these are just a bit, a bit about my uh, uh, creative process. And I uh, also mentioned that um, I feel like the most important step here could be also actually uh, the continuing engagement. Uh, it sucks that a lot of times that by the time a project is done, uh, everybody's already sort of thinking about the next thing. And I think there are a lot of missed opportunities when it comes to uh, engaging with like the function of spaces. Uh, it's nice to have a lot of colorful, big, powerful messages and the art and all that around the city, but uh, it's important to remember that the art is static and it just takes that continued effort and investment into the purpose, you know, and engagement and community building that uh, these projects are framed around. And so, uh, you know, I've, you know, done projects where we get the project up and there's like an initial sort of round of programming. And then a year later, uh, you know, the community has shifted and the audience has changed and nobody, you know, is engaged with this work. And so I think that they're just, and then nobody understands like why the work is. So there's just, this needs to be, there's just this continued plan, like through the life of projects uh, in terms of how uh, we're going to be engaged and how we're going to continue uh, kind of sort of teaching the community as it grows um, what to do with these uh, creative projects. Um, when I'm dealing with uh, the community. So these are just some of the factors I'm dealing with in terms of just the, who lives there. Um, Cause everybody has sort of like different motivations in terms of why they support or don't support uh, a project. And it's just very important to understand all of, all of those things. And then for actual engagement activity, uh, I found that uh, connecting with, you know, you got to connect with the people in the businesses that um, folks already trust. Um, I think that the most powerful people in uh, neighborhoods are probably just those public figures. It's those, uh, uh, what is it, religious leaders, those community organizers, those uh, local celebrities, it's those people who know a lot of people and whose opinions are largely respected by like, a, you know, big chunks of their community. And sometimes having them on your side is, um, you know, more important or it's more valuable when it comes to the engagement than you know, where, you know, it, it happens at the business level or at a civic level. And, and then, yeah, so the role of public art, um, I think that that's, yes, that's place uh, keeping. I, I like the word place keeping more so than place uh, making. And that's because uh, in surveys and actually just talking to people uh, through projects, I've learned that uh, place making implies that like nothing was there and it applies that uh, things need to be put there or this project is going to then make this space count versus place keeping where it recognizes, you know, what's there and, you know, that the project is, you know, only meant to like uplift that. Uh, and yeah, through my project, I can say I definitely learned that people really pay attention to that and that interpretation is huge just when it comes to uh, 
people, you know, actually receiving the work. And then other things, yeah, uh, community building, uh, continued engagement um, that I've mentioned before. And I think that's about, um, you know, planning like continued experiences, expecting those experiences to change and those activities to be different as you program, you know, through the life of a, you know, creative project and, you know, being okay with those different outcomes long as, you know, they're working towards, you know, a shared goal. I think, it, you know, even at a micro level, it, when it comes to connecting people, um, they make a big difference. Um, and I'll say that I add value. So when I say add value, I think that's in two ways. Uh, so there's, uh, when it comes to public art, it's always like a, I don't know, a monetary, economic property, commercial type of value, but then it's like that cultural value uh, where you say creating those teaching moments and those building those avenues of like collective expression and, you know, be that social commentary with protests, whatever. Um, I think it's important just to, you know, make sure that the artist adding, you know, value and that it reflects, you know, common ideas and communal spirit and that people can see themselves participating in it. Um, <clears throat> and because that's, I put visual enhancement last because um, it's aesthetic driven and I've been met, it's been received both ways in my work. So there's definitely like areas of the community where the quality of life is already better or, you know, it's higher. And then art for the sake of art makes more sense to people. Whereas uh, in areas of city, like I do a lot of work east of the river and I've certainly been met with pushback um, by folks seeing it as a waste of resources when they feel there's so many other things that need to be done. And they, they, you know, I've been told that like the art is a distraction or it's covering up from like, you know, the real issues and it's hard for them to see, you know, the benefit or the value of it through the lens of their like daily experiences. And so some of the ways then to, you know, build that access um, is through the asset, the continued engagement that's investing. Also, I think into the pool of ideas that come from non-artists and, you know, residents and um, stakeholders who aren't you know, necessarily connected to the art, but they have in terms of like the things that need to be done, the messages, the causes, um, those are things that can be connected with better through the art. Uh, and yes, arts education, that's just increased exposure. A lot of people don't know what public art is. I've definitely done surveys in neighborhoods where I know there, there are two or three murals and you ask people, you know, are there any public art projects around you? And they say no, and they don't know what that is. And so it's just about really make, uh, helping people understand what it even is. And then yes, facilitating and helping, you know, property owners get involved and, and creating spaces and tapping into, you know, uh, the events that are already happening and sort of just creating more avenues for that. And then training artists about the business of arts. So not enough artists not understand just the business of it and um, you know, about a career of create being creative and also just building more avenues to mentorship uh, and creative projects that foster uh, deeper, broader sense, you know, just ways for collaboration. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I got. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think everyone's giving you the snaps right now, Candace. <laughs> if they if they could, they would be clapping. Um, I saw a lot of in, in, in the chat um, that, that people really resonated well with the the, 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 the the distinction of placekeeping versus placemaking. Um, that 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 is um, really really spot on. And thank you for um, pulling that out and identifying that. Um, you you've answered probably all of my questions in in your slides, but I probably want to just have a little bit of, of, of further dialogue on on your ideas for ongoing programming. So you know I know you know either and and I know how you get your funding matters to how to how long you can sustain ongoing programming, of course. Um, and so knowing that. Yeah, uh, the funding may be gone, or um, you, know, you, you may have to apply to an, another grant to have programming to engage the space already created, you know, to, to have ongoing um, activities for the community. Knowing that, what would be recommendations for ongoing programming? Um, I think, well, I mean, yes, funding is the biggest factor in terms of how long we can sustain, you know, that engagement programming. Um, but I'll, I'll say that there are just kind of maybe different ways to, um, I look at what that programming is, uh, 
um, in say I think you know specifically about to say the commission where I know you know we're working with artists, dancers, musicians, all of these different you know creative um, avenues, and you know it's about creating opportunities like in terms of the five dollar mural, and you know letting that be the backdrop for a dance performance, letting that be you know something you know we can activate that thing, we can project animation on it, we can you know make it move and tell a new story. Uh, you know, what happens when you mix a, you know, a graphic designer with a theater person, like what type of project comes up with that? And then, you you know, get in, if, think about it in front of this sculpture, in front of this space you've already created. So I just think it's about, you know, it's just about thinking about it differently. And um, it, I think it's, you know, just being a bit more proactive. I, I know there's a lot of artists and there's a lot of ideas. And I think it's just, it's just sometimes hard to know you know, how to pitch it, how to present it. Now it's, um, I feel like a lot of the, you know, some of the things I do, they wouldn't necessarily, if I read the guidelines for, you know, some of the grants, they don't necessarily seem like they fit or it doesn't make sense. Or you want to, you know, you want funding for your idea, but that, you know, sometimes it's hard to, you know, you're competing in a sea of ideas. And, you know, like you, you like it just took, took a long time so it's, I would say that just to think about just different ways to do that, but then also, uh, you know, for the funders, for, um, you know, where that money comes from. It's just, you know, about, you know, thinking about talking with artists in consulting ways and, you know, what I'm saying investing in ideas that then lead to more projects. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and then I, I also want to just get, have an understanding of, um, again, I know funding funding drives uh, your response to this, but it, 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 are most of your projects artists seeking space and you go out and you find the space or are you always responding to and looking for RFPs to, to gain access to space and funding and get your, your work out there? I think uh, most of my projects probably as an individual have been driven by a business or an organization somebody having the space and not knowing what to do with it and you know just looking for some type of ideas and and guidance in that um i think a lot of there are a lot of people who have spaces and they want them to be active you know they want them to you know you know contribute in some way and the space to be usable but they just aren't sure what and it's not always i think and that's it goes back to the education when you're teaching people that public art is more than just a sculpture that they see or a mural. I feel like a lot of times people just think it's one thing and they aren't looking at their spaces. They aren't looking at the surfaces, the things in their spaces or what could be brought to their space. They aren't thinking about it in that way. So uh, I, it's a lot of people then, and then as an artist, you know, if, we, if I see a space, um, then, you know, I, you know, I've had to figure out, you know, the right way to approach this, this person. Can I work with this person? Then, you know, especially, you know, you're talking businesses who don't have the resources to put into, you know, art in that regard. And then it's just like, well, then how do you connect with some, you know, something like the commission or somebody who would have funding and it's just trying to navigate all those different things and still be the artist. Right. So I, I hope everyone is listening, we're, you know, having a, a, a point, a meeting of minds of, Funding and space and partnerships. Um, hopefully, we're we're hearing some alignments happening now. Um, I want to invite you guys to start thinking about um, the next segment of what we're going to do as and, and put in the in the chat box of opportunities for for resource alignments. So let's kind of start ruminating um, from all that that's been said um, and um, start you know sh sharing possible re resources. Um, Thank you, Candace, so much. I think everyone, again, is probably all snap, snapped up, snapped up for, for Candace. And thank you for um, joining it and giving your Thanks. insights Thanks. and frustrations and um, and opportunity recommendations for uh, getting some art out there. Am I stalled? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, next up, we're going to hear from Chrissy Maselman, who's the Executive Director of Cultural DC. And this is a, a great segue in uh, into spaces, as their their whole goal is finding artists. So, um, Christy Mieselman is the executive director of Cultural DC, a nonprofit arts organization which makes space for art across Washington DC. 
Since her appointment in 2018 of October, Maislemann has facilitated projects like Ivanka Vacuuming by Jennifer Rubel, Mighty Mighty by Devon Shimoya Shimoyama, and This Is Not a Drill by Jefferson Pender. In addition to her, her curatorial work, Maislemann oversees Cultural DC's art space development, which works to create partnerships between arts organizations and commercial real estate developers in order to ensure affordable artist housing, studio space, and public art opportunities. So I'm gonna welcome Christy to the room. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, Devon, I'm gonna have you share my presentation if that's okay, just because I didn't test it and I don't want it to go wrong. Um, but thank you everybody. And I, I just wanna start a little bit and say that for those of you that don't know what Cultural DC does, I, I'm gonna kind of give you a high level just quickly. You know, we kind of do three things at Cultural DC. You know, we have our own programming where we present visual and performing arts organizations. We do that across town in vacant spaces, which I'll talk about. We, we do that in our mobile art gallery. Um, the second thing we do uh, is that we own and operate the Source Theater, which is a multidisciplinary performing arts um, multidisciplinary art space on uh, 14th Street, uh, where we have um, three fantastic resident organizations that we share space with. And then the third thing that we do is our art space development work. And this is really kind of where Cultural DC got its start, you know, back in the mid 90s, um, kind of as the downtown um, area was being redeveloped. Um, you know, we were kind of born out of some of these recommendations that said, you know, we need we need somebody that can come in and facilitate citywide and, and downtown arts and culture development. You know, we need somebody that can advocate um, for arts and culture investment that would benefit artists and arts organizations. And, and that's really kind of where our work started. Um, and um, some of the first projects we did, you know, we, we really played kind of an advocacy role or a lobbying role. And, and we spent time, you know, um, working and I'll say because Cultural DC kind of got our start in, in and around Gallery Place and Penn Quarter. So a lot of our initial projects, as I said, were like started kind of in that downtown area initially. Um, but some of our first projects really were, you know, us, you know, partnering with Shakespeare Theater and Arena Stage to go to lobby the city to say, hey, we need more art space. We need more theater space. You know, you're about to do this development on, um, you're gonna release an RFP um, for this development project on D Street in Northwest and in, in near Chinatown. And we want you to make sure there is, we want you to include a theater space um, as part of that development. And, you know, that that's kind of the work we did. And, and, and ultimately, you know, that project specifically that was how Willie Mammoth came to find their space on D Street. And so that's kind of a lot of the work that we were doing early on is was really kind of trying to carve out space for art and artists in the city. Devon, you can flip the slide, please. Um, and so really what I wanna focus on today is kind of really our work um, over the last 21 years and our, our relationships with developers, because that's a huge part of what we do. And I know we've talked a lot about partnership and collaboration. That is something that's absolutely built into our DNA. It's something that um, we think about not only in this work, but also in, in our work, um, in our own, you know, presenting work and, and our relationships with our, our resident organizations. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of the, our, one of our um, kind of pivotal partnerships. And this was a partnership we did with P and Hoffman um, that started in around 2003. Um, this was for a building that the DC government owned at 916 uh, G Street across the street from the Martin Luther King Library. Um, the city bid this out for um, a development they did a request for proposals. And I think back during this time, this was when there were, because the city was really trying to make investments in arts and culture, they were really offering a lot more incentives and, and, and um, tax credits and stuff for developers to include arts and culture into these development projects. And so, um, you know, this project with PN Hoffman, um, when it was kind of bid out was was done so in a way that would would carve out a significant amount of space within that project for arts and culture and ultimately um as and it was a condo project so but as part of that condo project there were 12 um live work artist housing units um that were made available to artists this was one of the very first kind of live work artist 
studio opportunities that the city had ever done. Um, and in addition to that, there, there was uh, a significant amount of um, what I would say is retail space for um, arts and culture as well. And so that through that partnership that we did with um, P and Hoffman, Cultural DC uh, was able to carve out a space where we created the Flashpoint Gallery, the Mead Theater Lab, um, and our uh, dance studio. And you know that space that was kind of the first time that Cultural DC had a physical space that we operated in, and it really kind of was the beginning for us. Um, you know, we worked with the developer on the Live Work Housing. Um, project to to be able to identify artists, you know, to operate a lottery um, and an application process to identify artists that that could be in a position to to buy that space. Um, we operated the space kind of as an incubator, um, and so we really did work with like young at the time young organizations. You know, Step Africa was one of our first resident organizations. Washington Improv Theater, and um, so we worked with a number of. Um, uh, arts artists and arts organizations kind of in this in this space. Um, uh, Devon, you can flip the slide, please. I think one of the other um, big projects that we've been involved with and continued to be involved with um, is the the parks at Walter Reed. This is a, a project um, with three developers, Urban Atlantic, Hines, and Trident. Um, this is a project, I think, because of the work that we've done over the years, you know, developers have kind of come to know cultural DC as as the the I would hope the go to arts organization for this kind of work. And and with our work at Walter Reed, we teamed up with the developer very early on in the process. You know, so when when the government owned this, um, you know, when there was a plan for this project to come back as part of the base realignment project. Uh, when the army was going to transfer this prop property to the district of Columbia, you know, we knew that district was going to put out an RFP and very early on as part of that RFP process, we partnered with the development team and, and they brought that kind of benefit into the RFP process to say, like, not only are we developers, we're going to bring along this cultural partner with us and they're going to help guide us and they're going to work with the community to kind of really understand what the community really wants at this site. You know, this is a site that has been closed off to the public for a number of years um, because it was a military base or a military um, uh, yeah, base. And so um, for years, not residents weren't allowed in. Um, there were some kind of special things that, you know, opportunities and events that where that did happen. But I think suddenly this was going to become, you know, a large scale 66 acre campus that had a lot of opportunities. Um, and so we were brought in as part of that project. Um, there are a number of buildings, historic buildings on the site that have been flagged for cultural use. And so we continue to work with the developers to identify cultural organizations or um, tenants that could come in and operate that. You know, last year we worked with the developers to create an RFP to identify a tenant, a long term tenant for the historic firehouse. Um, and so we are kind of working to finalize those deals. But in addition to that, I think um, there have been a lot of opportunities kind of throughout this process. This is a multi year development. It's going to be, it's, it's been going on for a number of years. It's going to continue. But um, kind of throughout that process, what's really exciting is like, we're at a, a phase with the development that the campus has been opened up to the public. So they're working on kind of connecting the public streets, but there's no longer security. You no longer have to go, go through security to get to the site. There are people, there's veteran housing that has opened up on the site. There's additional housing um, projects that'll be um, opening later this year, as well as a number of nonprofit organizations and other businesses that will be um, you know, coming to live on this site. But with that have come a lot of opportunities for cultural engagement kind of in the interim. I think that, you know, we have worked with um, the developers and, and partnered um, with, uh, you know, Chris Naum at Listen Local First to, to, to help put on the Down in the Reeds Music Festival. Uh, we were a partner with Halcyons by the People Festival there. Um, and, and back in 2017 as part of a project um, with the Office of Planning and uh, funded through a, a project of, of Kresge, you know, we worked on the Crossing the Street project, which was really about um, kind of bringing in what the community wants, getting the community to kind of literally cross the street into this 
into the site and really understand what the, the needs were. And, and for this, we did a lot of feasibility. We did a lot of community outreach. We spent a lot of time literally going door to door in the community um, to really understand what kinds of things that the community wanted on that site. And then it's our job to take that back to the developers and say, here are opportunities um, where we can bring in artists to do something, or we can bring in this arts organization to occupy this space. Um, and so I think that's been um, really exciting and, and that's an ongoing project there. And I think there are a lot of projects like this, you know, this is a very large scale project. You know, the portion that the developers are redeveloping is about 66 acres. Um, and I think we're going to see some more of these large scale development projects happening across the city um, at the armed forces campus in northeast at the McMillan sand filtration site in northwest. Um, as well as a number of, um, you know, big projects that are uh, east of the river. Um, so, Devon, you can. Um, with that. Um, I think as we um, have kind of shifted our focus, and I, I think it was interesting, you know, I think for us, and I'll just mention briefly about our mobile art gallery and, and the programming that we do, you know, for, for about 13 years, we operated the Flashpoint Gallery. We operated that space at G Street. And, and I think what we found, we came to a point a few years ago where we really felt like you know, we're lucky to live in Washington. There are so many great museums on the mall that are free, but and and we have this free space. But at the same time, we also felt like there's so many people in our community that don't feel like the museums on the mall are a place for them, or even a free gallery in Chinatown is a space for them or a space where they feel comfortable. And it really got us thinking about how we could kind of turn that, you know, on its side. And how could we, instead of having people come to us, how can we take art art to the people. And, and we do that in two ways. Obviously, um, one way here is, is the way that we activate vacant spaces. But I'll also just briefly say is that, you know, we, we did build this mobile art gallery and that was a project we did through a PABC grant. And that is a 40 foot shipping container that we, we move around the city and, and bring art into communities. And so those two things, you know, I think the way that we do our our programming and the way that we approach our programming is really thinking about how we can get out into communities. And to do that, we we really do look to our relationships and with that we've made over the years with our real estate developer partners, because they're the ones that own property in this town. And they're the ones that are sitting on lots of vacant space that needs activating. And so I think that's where we really turn, you know, this is a great example of a project where we, we partnered with um, the uh, JCR developers to kind of reactivate what was a vacant space at the time. Um, and we've done that through through a number of, of projects. Um, and you can you can flip the slide. Again, we've done a number of partnerships with Edens, a developer that is developing um, one of the areas at Union Market. Um, and, and we've done a number of activations with them, both activating vacant space to do a project like you see above here with Wickerham and Lomax that are Baltimore based artists and then below where we've brought our mobile art gallery to the site. Um, and I think this has given us um, a lot of ways to, um, you know, again, more opportunities to go into different communities and, and work with the communities there and really leverage those relationships that that we have with real estate developers. Ron, you can flip it. I think, uh, you know, as we've said, again, partnerships and collaborations are, are so key. And I think that when we, we do the work that we're doing, you know, we go out into different communities and we're always looking for partners and, and community anchors. And I think, you know, back in 2019, we took our mobile art gallery um, to um, Ward 8 to the ARC, where we partnered with the ARC um, for Devin Shimoyama's barbershop project. This was a... Um, an installation, like I said, in our mobile art gallery where Devin, who is a Pittsburgh artist, um, created this um, fully functional, um, totally immersive barbershop um, in Ward 8 at the ARC. We, we, um, it actually operated as a barbershop. We worked with um, a barber partner in town that provided barbers that gave free haircuts to the community. Um, and in that, I think what was so great about going to the ARC was that um, for those of you that don't know, I absolutely encourage you to to go check out the ARC. There is so much um, amazing stuff happening over there because there's so many built in partners. You know, yes, it's a theater space. Yes, there's a black box. But what's so great about the ARC is that there's the art reach that there's Philip 
collection, there's the Boys and Girls Club, DC Central Kitchen, Washington Ballet. And so, you know, when we go into this, you know, and specifically for this project, you know, we really engage all those stakeholders. It's really important for us. You know, not only do we kind of create these little advisory committees, um, kind of that include members of the community um, there, because, you know, we want to create projects that are impactful, that have long-term impact, and that are that that are meeting the community needs, but um, you know, kind of working then also with these partners on programming. You know, I think as part of this, um, we created different projects for for ArtReach and the Phillips Collection um, that they were able to tie in not only to our project, but and so I think you know, going into to projects or going into communities where they're already there's already built-in infrastructure. Um, is is already helpful, you know, and, and, and you're kind of, you know, there's no reason to recreate the wheel in some ways. And so I think this is a really good um, thing for people to think about, you know, when you're trying to approach new projects and find areas is, is looking for areas where there is kind of um, there, there already is a community that exists like a cultural community. I would say um, you can flip the slide down. Thank you. Um, I think too, I will just say, um, and, and I know Corinne talked a lot about um, the bids, um, but we have found a lot of success in working with the bids in the main streets, um, specifically with our mobile art gallery. I think we have found that like real estate developers, the bids in main streets are very eager to activate vacant spaces, but activate their parks with public art and different um, kind of projects that can activate their community. And so we've worked with a number of, as I said, bids and, and even the main streets across the city um, to really think about, you know, their underutilized spaces and how we can help them um, activate those. Um, so that's kind of all I've got, Alyssa. I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you've got some good questions. All right. Thank you so much. I think you um, really thank you for, for drawing out, um, again, the, the theme of, of aligning with partnerships and um, and collaborations and uh, different ways to access space and make space. Um, a mobile gallery is like <laughs> making space <laughs> out of, you know, and, and bringing space everywhere. So that, um, I, I guess, I know we touched on, on a couple different opportunities, I guess for, for, for everybody else too, um, are there any non-traditional space makers that we could share with or think of that aren't developers or, or, or bids or main streets? Is there anybody else that, that we could probably let, our, that would be a weird option maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're gonna see with COVID, unfortunately, is that there's gonna be a lot of vacancy across the city. And I think that's that's a really unfortunate kind of outcome of, of what we're, we're kind of going through is that there will be a lot of um, space that will be available. And I think that I would say, you know, businesses are, you know, we talk about bids and main streets, and I think those are kind of the outlet and, and the access point to some of the, um, the, the businesses, but I think businesses are great. I think even churches um, are great spaces and great places, community centers. There's a lot of space. I think for us, you know, our mission really focuses on thinking about unconventional space. You know, we've really moved away from like a traditional brick and mortar gallery um, for our own programming and, and for theater. And I think we're trying to find inno innovative ways um, that you can not only create, put visual arts in a, in a vacant space, but you can put performing arts in a vacant space. There's a lot of ways to activate that. And so I think, you know, I think when people kind of get out of their own way and, and realize that, you know, churches are great spaces, um, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity in our city, um, and I think it's just tapping into some of those people. Whether it's like you know coming to cult, somebody like Cultural DC or tapping into some of these other connectors. Obviously, the commission offers a lot of resources, but I do think there are some kind of individuals that are out there um, that are kind of taught you know keyed into this. I think Philippa Hughes and the Pink Line Project is is a great example of that. Ian Callender, who, you know, who um, works for Sweet Nation and, and runs the Sandlot spaces, you know, these are people that are actively out there kind of creating space um, in the community. Yeah, true. Um, so I know uh, a big buzzword and people are all like wanting, wanting to know more or how, but with um, all the empty spaces due, due to COVID, um, downtown, what are you, what are you hearing of, of, of people doing opportunities for these vacant spaces. Um, what, kind, what kind of programming are, are you hearing or developing for these vacant spaces? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, as I said, I think there's going to be a huge op opportunity, unfortunately, and I know that um, the developers and owners of these spaces are going to be eager to, to, to fill these spaces, even if it's temporary. And so um, I think there's, you know, we're at this really great um, kind of I don't want to say it's a crossroads, but it's, it's, it's like an exciting time where we can really think about like, what does art really look like? I think over the last year, we've all been challenged in like, how do we program? How do we get our own art there? And what does that look like? And what are our true needs, um, you know, moving forward? And I think that's is is really exciting because I think people are going to start thinking about space in a different way mm -hmm. and thinking about space in a more creative way. And I think you know, the opportunity for additional vacant space is is kind of limitless. Yeah. Um, and I think I'll ask this lastly, um, and I guess this, this goes to more of the of your core practice with working with a, a developer. Um, I'm curious to know um, the the process as as to how 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 and when an artist, you know, the call, the art, the artists come in and envision, you know, how it happens, and then what resources would an artist need to respond to one of these RFP RFQs that that you would work with with a developer? You know, do, do, they, need, do, they, need, do they need to know CAD or how to sketch or you know what 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 do they need to have in their toolbox to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing I would say for artists specifically that are looking to get into this is is to find, you know, I know it's like finding these opportunities is like the first step, right? How, how do I find them? And I will say that like, you know, Cultural DC's website and through our art space development is a great resource for that. We have a great page for artists um, that are interested in these types of projects. Um, and I think, you know, you can go there and sign up on our website so that you get notifications about when these opportunities come about. But typically like for us, the process is that a lot of times because we've been doing this work for so long, you know, we find that developers and businesses are coming to us and they're saying, okay, Christy, we've got this building, we want to put an art space or we've got this wall and we need a mural. And then, then I go to my, you know, then I go to my, my, my Rolodex of artists. I look through all the artists that are submitting um, you know, to our webpage to say like, I'm, I'm a muralist or I have this project, I have this idea for a project. Um, and I think then, then working with kind of the, the developers that way. And I, I think, you know, I think developers understand. And, and I think that's why in some ways, like we're this great go between cultural DC, because like, we understand that not every artist, you know, has, you know, has the ability to do fancy drawings or CAD drawings. And, and I think this is where we can be really helpful in, helping the developer um, envision, you know, what, and translate an artist's idea into that vision. And I think, you know, that's where, like, we can play that role. And so I think, you know, really just finding, um, you, you, you know, sticking with the, the ideas. And I think having good ideas is, like, the biggest, that's where you should focus your energy. You know, it's not about CAD drawings or being able to have, like, the best photography to, to showcase your work. Because, the end of the day, we don't, you know, everybody should manage their resources the right way. And and to me, that's not where I would, and having been an artist, I had done this too. I just, you know, nowadays, I think um, we're so fortunate with the technology, the way it is that now cell phone photos are great. And there's so much we can do kind of on a low tech way that I think can, can easily be translated. Gotcha. Um, thank you. And then I guess for an artist to be considered you know, to get in the cultural DC pool, um, how how do folks submit their works or portfolios, or you know, tell, let everyone know what what you need to um, grow your, your, your pool of artists. Yeah, I mean, I think again, I I would definitely go to our website. We have a great page on our art space development that's got some resources both for developers and for artists. Um, and I think just being part of that list is really important. And I'll say that like. We're watching, you know, like I, I'm, you know, I think that like, if you're following cultural DC on Instagram and Facebook, like we're looking at all those things. And I think, you know, we're out there in the community. I think as we do this, these projects, you know, as we take the mobile art gallery into communities, kind of as part of that outreach and that community engagement, we're meeting artists in those communities. That's how I met Candace. Candace and I brought, we brought the mobile art gallery to Ward 7 and Candace taught a photography workshop for young kids in the community. And so I think, you know, that's what's exciting for me is like making sure you're kind of just engaged in your community. And if, if you're out there and making yourself known, then we're going to, we'll know about you. 
All right. So good, do good work and post it and share it and it will be seen. <laughs> it will be seen. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Christy, for sure. your advice and words. Um, you are a great segue into our, our, our last um, sharer for the day, and then we'll open it up to, to resource sharing. Um, but I, wanted, I want to give some time to Bailey Ellison, who's uh, a developer at JBG. So um, Chrissy's segments were, were a lot about, you know, working with developers to, to find space. And um, now we can hear on the, on the developer side um, their, their processes and, and, and how um, public art is a part of, of their muscles. So I, I want to welcome Bailey to the conversation. Hi everyone, thank you all for having me. It's great to be here. Um, and yeah, so I'm uh, Bailey Edelson. I'm an SVP at JBG Smith in our development group. Um, I've been working in the development realm for the last um, 10 or so years. I spent a little bit time in, of time in our investments group to have, you know, kind of looked at um, some different things uh, in the industry. And then in terms of the uh, areas I've been focused, um, primarily in Fairfax County and the development side, um, but also on projects in DC, um, Maryland, uh, and now I'm spending a lot of time in Arlington and Alexandria as well. Um, and to just give you a little bit of background um, on JBG Smith, uh, in case um, people aren't familiar with us, um, we are a local uh, real estate investor developer. Um, we're now uh, a publicly traded uh, real estate investment trust, uh, but uh, prior to three years ago, we were a private equity fund and development shop, uh, and we've been in the area for 60 plus years now. So um, have been um, owning and uh, developing projects in the region for, for a long time. Um, and, you know, we're, we're excited to be here because we have, we also have um, spent a lot of time engaging in the arts world, both through our projects, um, through our corporate uh, endeavors, um, and then also through our JBG, Care, JBG Smith Cares arm um, in terms of the philanthropic side. Um, as I think a lot of the panelists have talked about, um, you know, we, we really prioritize, you know, sort of the public art component to great spaces. Um, we, because we only work in one region, um, every project of ours pretty much is different. Um, and it, we try to be really responsive to the communities that we're working in and the locations and the neighborhoods. Um, we partner very often with um, a lot of the, the groups that are working in those neighborhoods um, to get that feedback, to get that input. Um, and to make sure that as we're looking at spaces that again, we're not, we're not um, sort of designing cookie cutter spaces that that aren't being responsive to what people are looking for and, and making places and buildings where people want to be, which ultimately, I think, you know, our goal is to sort of create value both to the community and then also to the projects as well. Um, and if we're not uh, creating value sort of across that spectrum, we're not, um, you know, again, we're not creating places where people want to be. Um, and then to talk just a little bit about the ways that we've done that, as I mentioned, you know, um, some have been very project specific. Um, you know, we have, there's a public space as part of, you know, developing a new building or set of buildings that either we or in consort with the community and the jurisdiction have identified as a, you know, an opportunity for public art. Um, sometimes it's a space that's already been sort of pre-designated for public art. And then what that, the, the character of that public art is very different. We've done everything from sculptures to murals to fountains. Um, we've really, you know, kind of run the gamut and and like to get creative um, and think about, you know, what what is really going to activate this space and this place um, for both, you know, future residents, tenants, and people who are already living um, in the community where we're um, investing and developing. Um, and then on the corporate side, um, we've done uh, a series of efforts, um, one of which I saw um, Gail Rebin is on. She participated in. We did um, a series of photographic commissions um, for our corporate office um, and the commissions. You know, we uh, worked with a curator to select um, a handful of, of artists. Um, we got sort of their feedback on what, you know, what neighborhoods or buildings we've built or places we've uh, been working that they may be interested in. And so um, that was was a really fun project that I actually personally worked on um, and came out with uh, uh, building a, a really great collection for our corporate office space um, that had a whole range of, it was all photography, but um, the, the 
the products were very different uh, because we had a whole uh, series of different artists. Um, so that was really fun. We also did a series of murals. Um, some of which in partner with uh, partnership with, you know, powwow DC, some of which uh, were, were sort of separate from that. We just, we had big walls or spaces um, or even underground parking garages that uh, we felt like needed sort of some color and some um, punch and interest. Um, and so we had a whole series on that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, we've also engaged in the arts community through our JBG Smith cares. Um, committee, which is uh, manages, it's an internal um, committee staffed by um, all employees, um, and we uh, we that's how we designate our um, philanthropic donations at a corporate level. Um, and one of our silos is arts in the community, um, and it is focused on regional, um, local um, arts organizations, um, and and our engagement there has really run the gamut from just you know. Uh, straight up uh, grants and cash contributions um, to partnerships on events to um, uh, volunteer hours. We do a daily or a year yearly day of giving pre COVID um, where our employees volunteer um, and have have partnered with organizations like the Turf Center for the Arts um, to donate our time as well. Um, and I think, you know, from our perspective, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we only work in one market. Um, we are. Uh, very committed to sort of engaging with the community and um, through with jurisdiction, sort of through all of the processes, whether it's an existing building and we're sort of managing the property on site um, to a development project where um, we're going through a design and entitlement process. Um, and we really, we get excited when people bring ideas to us and say, hey, this is a need in the community that we think this project could fill and let's, let's work together and collaborate. Um, so I think to answer some of the series of questions that have been asked in terms of, you know, how are how our projects identified, how are artists identified, um, it, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, sometimes it's us proactively going out because we've identified a place that we think um, should be a priority in terms of public art. Um, sometimes it's, it's the community or organizations in the community coming to us to say, hey, on this portion of your site, it would be great if we did this. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're usually very open to that, um, because again, we, we really want all of our projects to be different, um, and to be exciting and, and not feel the same. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, that's all I have to, to say at the moment, but I think, um, Alyssa maybe has some questions for me. Yeah, that's great sharing. I think, um. This helps people just get an idea of the processes, right? As to like how and when. And I know when we spoke, I know I asked you like, um, you know, what's something built? Is the artist there at the beginning or in the middle or the end? I, I know that that's um, always just depending up to, up to the space. Um, and I, I think um, when uh, when it when it is, uh, I think people people you know I guess ha have an idea of developer public art equals trophy statue, which is like basically a, a statue at, at, at the beginning of your at the entrance of your um, of your establishment. So uh, I guess um, respond to trophy statue and, <laughs> um, and 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 how you guys uh, is that the status quo? How how is JBG you know inserting the, their public arts? Um, with you know in 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 a new and, and innovative ways yeah i mean i think it's not the status quo for us I, I won't say yeah we've never done a project that has public art in that form but i can't i can't think of one and every one i can think of has some sort of different aspect to it uh, again sometimes some sort of a sculpture is what makes sense for the space sometimes it's um murals or painting or um you know, as I said, I, I worked on a project where it was a it was a fountain, but it was designed with umbrellas were the theme, and it had uh, a series. You know, it lined a walkway. Um, and so, again, for us, it's how do we make each space unique? Um, public art is a really exciting and interesting way to do that, or or component of that. Um, and so, um, it really, for us, it's it's part of that visioning process for the site, which, you know, obviously we have visions, but it's it's also as as we're visioning, we're thinking about 
you know, what is the jurisdiction expecting? What sort of master plans are in place? What, you know, what visioning has the community already done as part of some of those pro public processes? In many places we work, there are public arts master plans that we're, you know, sort of being cognizant of and responding to. There are lots of um, local arts organizations that we're partnering with who, um, you know, have, have thoughts on that too. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I don't, it's really not part of our DNA anymore in terms of, or, or if it ever was, I'm not sure that it really ever was, but, um, you know, to, to plop a building and pop a piece of art and say, see you later. Um, we, we only work in one market. And so, um, it is important to us to be sort of creating, um, unique and interesting spaces in all of our projects that are sort of responsive to where they are. I thought the conversation in terms of place making versus place keeping is an important one and something that that we're um, often thinking about um, in terms of how do we be sort of respectful and responsive to what's already in a place. Um, but, you know, what what can we bring um, as we bring a new development online that sort of enhances that and is, is responsive to some of the needs um, that we're hearing as part of the community and um, and the jurisdiction. Amazing. Um, and I think lastly, and then we'll open up to some Q and A, but lastly, um, uh, JBG has, you know, it's a developer. You guys have retail space. I, I, I know every intent is to get people back in their spaces and, and the retail spaces, but in the interim, is JBG reaching out to communities or should artists be reaching out to you with ideas? Um, how, what's, what's, what's this interim looking like, you know, for, for you guys? Yeah, I mean, it's something that at a high level is uh, is something we're very focused on. I mean, obviously that ground floor experience is critical to how a place lives and feels and works. Um, we are very focused on doing what we can to support our retail tenants through this time and that depending on the retail tenant that looks different differently. Um, and, and so there's that process is happening. Some of its proactive outreach from us to tenants, some of its tenants reaching out directly to us. Um, but we are, uh, you know, that is a high priority for us to say, how can we, you know, how can we support you through this time? What can we do? What can we do in terms of activation? We've supported streeteries in different locations um, to, again, try and help out some of our restaurant tenants. Um, and, you know, I don't have a one size fits all answer. Uh, we rarely do uh, in our portfolio because everything is so different. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's a mix. Some of it's us coming up and saying, okay, well, we have this space and and we've got this set amount of time where we could do something and and here's an idea that could work. Um, and us reaching out proactively and sometimes it's people bringing ideas to us. So um, I would say you know we're we're very open to those ideas. Um, it often gets complicated in terms of tenants having certain rights in certain spaces and um but but at a high level um we are usually very creative and, and that and the initial uh uh idea of a of a conflict isn't doesn't scare us we'll usually try and work through that if we think it's sort of the right thing to do um um for the place so uh not not a not a simple answer, um, but it is, I think, as Christy highlighted, it is something that we're all going to be grappling with for quite a while. And um, it's we're, we're trying to think of all the different ways we can keep those spaces activated um, and tenants supported uh, until we get back to some some sense of normal. Okay. Normalcy, right? I know. Yeah, and, whatever, and I, whatever that means. <laughs> I know, and, and whenever that is. So and, until then, we're in this interim phase and pivoting and navigating and and, and all of that. Um, I think, um, and and I know that, that there's factors that um, that you know us outsiders don't know. Like you know, even though this place is empty, you, there's some maybe a lease on it, or you know, things things of that nature that um, that you know aren't. Um, Aren't, aren't aren't as visible, you know, to all of us. So um, I know I, I have a slide that, that shares um, Billy's uh, information. So um, we'll be able to to further the conversations if, if if there's ever any. But I want to thank you, Billy, for your time today and, and sharing yeah. and coming out and talking to this community. Um, and I want to open this up uh, this time now for some resource sharing quickly and, and some Q and A. So um, for example. Um, I'll pick some off as, as, as an idea. So 
sharing resources amongst all of us, right? We all have great programming that we're doing. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to bring people to our, our, our locations. And um, for example, an opportunity may be if you are a festival or bringing out um, many different kinds of public art, maybe we can make it a traveling, a traveling exhibition. And it could, it could, you know, it could go to other places in DC besides storage, you know, <laughs> for, for some artists. So um, wanted to invite um, folks to, to offer, offer any uh, other resources, uh, ideas uh, to expand our, our public offering. Um, you can either raise your hand or Put it in the so, chat. So I um, I was keeping track of the chat as you all were talking. Um, if Michael Feldman is still in the room, what I'm going to do, um, and everybody else, raise your hand if you have a question, and then I'll just go ahead and put you in the queue as well, and then unmute your mic when it is your turn so that we can have a little bit of order. Um, because we have a lot of people in a room. And so I definitely want to appreciate everybody to come out, um, enjoy the conversation, thank my colleagues and thank all of the partners who um, participated with us today. And so I'm going to go, if Michael felt, man, I'm going to go ahead and unmute his mic if he still has a question. I, I sent you the request, sir. I, you can uh, go ahead. Um, so uh, the resource I wanted to mention is uh, Upstart Collab, which does uh, impact investing, or uh, coordinates resources for impact investing with uh, arts and culture uh, focus. So that's Upstart Collab would be a, a resource that I would recommend. And then my, my question was just uh, in terms of um, Upcoming uh, for the uh, new spaces, how, how do um, organizations like uh, the Golden Triangle bid and the uh, uh, cultural DC, how do they deal with spaces that are projected, proposed, like 11th Street Bridge, uh, you know, the park north of uh, DuPont, uh, DuPont Circle? those kinds of spaces that aren't there yet, but will be soon. Thanks so much for this session. Great, thank you. So I, um, thank you, Michael. If you could, if you could uh, put your resource in the chat, the Upstart Collab, the link that, that'd be great to share with everybody. And um, if Christy and um, Corinne could respond to his question. Uh, he, you were a little bit hard to hear, Michael. So hopefully they 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 heard you to respond. Yeah, I'm not her, I'm not sure I fully heard the the question in there, as it related to some of the bigger projects. It's it's about um, how do you plan for the for the future when there are projects that are proposed. Uh, into that. Yeah, you broke up again. Is it possible if you can just type it in a um, I think I, chat and I'll be happy to read it off? Go ahead. I think I understand a little bit of what he's asking and can jump in on that a little bit if that's helpful. Go for it. Thank you, Corinne. Um, so I, I know he was he was asking about what's happening. Um, it's actually north of the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District um, in DuPont Circle, and it's something that um, the DuPont Circle bid and the DC Department of Transportation are working on uh, with DuPont Circle itself, and I think a bit north of the circle. Um, and you know, we're of course very interested in what's happening there, but it's outside of um, our boundary. But the the bids all work together really well and talk with each other, especially when it's projects that relate to one another. Um, we do work on a lot of really long-term public space design projects. So right now we're working with the DC Department of Transportation on projects, a, a huge streetscape redesign project on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and that's an, the nice thing about, you know, being a part of this team as a curator is that I get to be a part of the conversation early on and how arts gets integrated um, into it, which I think is so important too often. It's an, 
it can be um, an afterthought. So it's nice to be, a, you know, a, a part of the, the planning process. So hopefully that gets at a little bit of what Michael was asking. Thank you, Corinne. Okay, Devon, can you um, yep. go to the next, next person? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We have Shani Sha. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name uh, wrong. You can correct me. I'm about to unmute you now. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you see me? Hear me? Yes. Um. Wonderful. It's Shani She. Thank you. Um. That was a. Uh, My apologies. I've heard though. <laughs> That's okay. Um. So thank you for this um, presentation. Um, my question um, is that, um, my bad, I'll, I'll introduce myself first. I, I'm an artist, uh, I paint murals, um, and I also uh, run a youth art program uh, for youth in Chinatown called uh, Chinatown Art Studio. Um, I also work in um, uh, tenant organizing. <laughs> um, and so I, I wanted to say that um, I think Candice's uh, presentation um, resonated with uh, with many of us because it is painful uh, for for us as artists who work in the community um, to participate in um, place making programs that have you know that that sometimes have deeper problematic impacts in our community. So, uh, what I want to ask is if you know um, DCCAH uh, partnering bids, main streets, and developers um, are are willing to uh, I guess address and, and change the ways um, their, you know, this public art programming feeds into systemic racism and displacement of, uh, of uh, our communities, you know, working class communities of color. Um, and and for, for example, you know, bids very powerfully shape our cities in the ways that Karen mentioned, you know, control of public space, benefit from public uh, private partnerships, shaping development, um, and, and, you know, this intensive branding of neighborhoods through creative placemaking. Um, and this includes murals. So, you know, the vast majority of, of boards on, on groups like bids are developers, banks, and property owners, you know, at least 51% required by, by law. Um, so there's automatically this power imbalance. So, you know, how can we work with these groups where communities and, you know, long-term residents automatically do not really have um, decision-making power and if I if if they did have power in these spaces, I, I believe all these vacancies we're talking about, you know, that provides opportunities for us to to come in and, and create art. Those vacancies would be there, you know. They would be used to to house the thousands of folks who are in desperate need of housing. Um, so we have these like institutions that sponsor progressive public art um, and and lift up the stories and histories of our communities on one hand, but then push them out on the other, and so. Long, I guess long story short, like how how can we as artists and organizations ethic, ethically um, do this work, you know, in an in such an inequitable context? How can we challenge the ways or sorry the reasons why bids and developers, you know, are such uh, central sources for for our funding? And so you know, yes to the idea of placemaking, and I think it um, really inspired a lot of us. But you know, it's 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 going to be hard to do that without help, right? From from uh, all these institutions to to push structural change. So that's my uh, long winded question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, and I'll I'll just uh, respond for, and then if anybody else on the panel has what has a response too. But uh, essentially, I think the 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 theme of today was establishing partnerships. So if you are a a small entity and and you know need access to resources. Um, you know, there's there they 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 exist. We usually need, need need to find each other, right? So the the goal the goal for today was to be able to see who's in the room, establish 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 some some partnerships and connections and, and ideas to to access um, these spaces. Um, and um, so I, I I would I would tell you number one that, that you're welcome to to reach out to me and and, and I can um, facilitate some. Some, some relationships as well and, and partnerships, but um, I, I think that, that that's that's the the, the key for um, and knowing who you want to work with and the avenue that, that you're trying trying to to reach um, can go through. I'll, I'll let anybody else on the panel respond briefly, and then I have some closing words. 
I'll just say from my perspective, and I think it's really we, like our approach is that, you know, when we're working with these developers and we're working on some of these our projects, um, you know, I think we really do want the communities, input and the community, especially from groups that are operating in those specific communities. And I think the agencies are a great opportunity. I know that even a lot of these really big projects, ultimately, you know, there is some level, at, you know, and there is some point in the process where. Um, it does involve ANC meetings and, and I spend a lot of time as part of the projects and I, I go with our developer partners. I go on our own to advocate for artists and advocate for specific projects at that community level. Because I think, you know, if you can get the support of the ANC and I think, you know, especially if you're in Chinatown in that area, you know, working with your ANC to really advocate that that community is being represented in these projects is, is really powerful. And I, Bailey, I'm sure you would kind of attest to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's a really a really good point. Is you know, the ANCs are an excellent avenue, um, and they have you know they have a lot of influence in the zoning process and what's sort of designed and approved as they should. Um, and so while bids, you know, and and um, some chambers of commerce and things like that, which may be a little bit more business oriented um, because of their function, you know, there are lots of, of great um, sort of community based groups and the ANC is being um, being a big one, especially in that um, design and approval process. Um, you know, I think there is there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration. And I think, you know, when you when you look around the city at, at who is working here, um, you know, I think for the most part, you have a lot of development companies that really are interested in that community engagement process and getting that feedback so that they can incorporate it, it into the project. Um, and there is sort of a genuine interest in getting it. And the ANCs are, are a great avenue um, that are very integrated into that um, uh, process within uh, DC. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. pause right here for just 1 second. We request a little of everyone's time. I know we're supposed to be ending in, in, in just 2 minutes. So let me just quickly, um, um, Devon, if you could just share the, the last, uh, slides that I have. Um, up for on, on our end, um, I want to that number 1, thank everybody for, for, for attending. Thank you to our panelists and speakers for, um, for, for, for sharing your. Inside knowledge, um, opinions, and, and everything. Uh, I do want to highlight that that we um, at, at the commission are, are doing um, this, this as endeavors to to inform and reach out to the communities. Um, here are our upcoming events. Um, tomorrow is a workshop on um, on on uh, how to apply and developing your your application for for grant submission. And on Friday, my colleague Sarah Gordon. Uh, is going to have an awesome uh, review of the art bank collection um, on May 4th. So you can see the practices of the collection that the commission um, builds and, and houses in, in, in their uh, in their collection. This this session will be uh, uh, um, uh, housed on the, the programming page. So if you want to review or touch base or or look again, um, next slide, um, Devon. And then um, I. Uh, if, if the panelists are okay to stay five, five more minutes, we can, we can take a, a, a couple more questions. Um, but I did want to invite Lauren Dugas Glover, the program manager uh, for the public art program, to say her her hello. <laughs> well, <clears throat> hello everybody, and thank you, Alyssa, for leading this this fabulous salon and discussion, and all the participants. Um, we've all worked together on some project or another. Um, and it's just wonderful to have this opportunity for you to share your, your level of expertise with this very uh, warm body. And I just want to say, Shani, I hear you. We hear you and um, invite you to follow up on uh, Alyssa's uh, request and anyone else who, um, <clears throat> who who is resonating with what she said. Um, and so let's put together some discussion opportunities and see what we can do. Um, we, we realize some of the barriers that are there, and we want to to work with all of you to find ways that we can um, remove some of the barriers and be more inclusive. Um, and um, understanding that, you know, I, 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 you know, place is something that exists here, um, and that communities need to understand that there is history and culture on every single street corner 
in Washington, D.C., and we need to honor and uplift that. And so um, that is very important. That is a very important part of how of how we um, it's place setting in the sense. And yes, um, it's very, very vital. So, again, thank you all for your your participation and the robust questions and. If the panelists are going to hang around, I'm going to be quiet and learn some more. I've been taking scrupulous notes and, uh, <laughs> awesome. and, have, okay. and have taken names and have taken names. So <laughs> <You'll> <laughs> we're, names. we're just continuing working with you. Yes. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah. Wonderful job. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so again, if anybody has stuff off, panelists included, please um, I, please do so if, if you need to. If you're able to stick around for five more minutes, we could take the, the couple questions that, that, that are, are in queue. So I'll say uh, a few things and bring up the next question as I see somebody's hand raised as I do have to go to another meeting. Um, but thank you, everybody. The next step, your next question is going to be coming from a uh, Clutrice Smith. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Um, you can go ahead and let me see. Unmute your mic. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having this panel and the opportunity to even have questions and answers. Um, I just wanted to find out because, you know, I'm a seasoned artist, but I have not connected with the art scene in the DC area. And I wanted to know what is the possibility or getting the opportunity to present our artwork or to partake in the uh, murals or the museums or any of the opportunities to come forward if we have not connected? Uh, is there an opportunity for a new artist to be able to do that? Thank you. Yes. So we we ha we have varying um, granting opportunities. That the the Arts Commission is, is is a granting organization, and we have uh, various granting opportunities to to do that. Am I am I stuck? Um, we'll we'll be we'll be rolling out uh, grant grant guidelines um, for public art building communities and mural CC both in mid March. Um, and then also on, on the grant side, they have uh, grants that support um, arts education, East of the River. Um, I don't know them all, but they're, 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 there are many. Um, but there, there are several ways to, to engage and, and, and get funding and, and know more about how, how to um, re-season yourself in, in, in the art scene in DC. Um, and again, I'm, I'm happy to talk through with, with you for, for any more of, of, the, of the offerings that the commission has too. And Alyssa, if I could also add, um, Art Bank um, is also going to open in May, as will the our curatorial exhibition grant program. These are all those two are also part of the public art um, program. And as I said, um, or we say on the other side of the house, there's a whole bevy of other kinds of um, art programs, including fellowships and art education. There's there's a, a plethora of places for emerging new artists, seasoned artists people who've never applied to a grant at CAH to do so. Okay, thank you so much for uh, for your answers. So is there a particular link that we should connect to in order to get those uh, invitations or to get the um, an email or submission to let us know when those times come? Is, or just say like, do we connect to dcarts.gov or is there a particular site that we can connect to for those that are um, emerging artists on, on this art scene for DC? Yes, um, I, it, it, it's, it's just been dropped in, in the chat, our website. Uh, you can sign up for our, our newsletter there and also see all of the guidelines w w when they do um, roll out. Okay, thank you very much. You'll have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Thanks for coming. All right. Uh, Devon, was there somebody else in, in queue? I'm going through the chat. Alyssa, um, Devon actually had to go, I think. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm from Karen Miller for Karen Miller. I would be interested in hearing um, trying to work with DuPont Underground and the proposed park north of the circle. Again, for Karen Miller. Oh, thank you, Vanessa. We we um, that that was the first question that that the the um, 
someone responded to already. for these opportunities and projects and how can we help them succeed in applying? Many artists I know do not know where to find these things or even that they are a possibility. A Google search isn't always enough and it is a part two. Yeah, you know, I, I've been taking notes a, a lot from our, our leading up to, to, to building this um, salon and it, it seems like there's, you know, all these lists and, and panels and um that that aren't that that, that aren't uh made available to everybody or, or everywhere so um i think it's it's on on us and uh, as organizations to, to for, for for data keeping um i know that um the, the commission has has multiple lists of, of opportunities so i i would say um if, if there's a, a particular genre that you're looking for, um, you can definitely um, email me and I can assess in, in finding artists or helping to select find artists that um, the commission is, is, is aware of, at least um, for the practice or, or the project. Okay, and the second part is additionally, are the applications or RFPs created and judged? How can we rethink these processes to bring more people to the table? Great. Um, yes, as a part of the as a part of the, the grant process, there there are um, RFQs that RFQs that, that go out um, and respond to. They are adjudicated by by peers. So the commission um, recruits panelists in in multiple different um, uh, genres of of media and, and work to review the panels and um in, to, to respond to to how was it how how, to, how they could know about the the calls yes i would direct them to our, our website and, and to be um in, in our newsletter to, to get the updates for for when our rfqs are, are released um okay. I, I would say and we you also on on social media, repost other people's uh, art calls as well. Um, so if you if if there's something that, that you're looking to to uh, share, you could um, email it to the commission uh, ch at dcarch.gov. And let's Excellent. do one more question just to be considerate of, of time. Sure. And this may be as my computer been I've been in and out, bouncing in and out as far as um, my the connection. Is funding from larger organization government agencies contingent on citizenship status, levels of education, computer literacy, etc. These are all huge barriers to access. Sorry, I had to digest all those um, <laughs> okay. all those segments. Um, uh for for education it's not it's at least for for on the granting side it, it's not it's not there's no educational requirement um all all of the all of the the works at least on, on the public art uh side mural cc and, and pabc um i'm speaking for specifically because that, that's what i manage um uh, do not have have an educational requirement um the the criteria is based on the the aesthetic and the community engagement portion of it how how it fits into the community and responds to the community um the, and how it benefits the community um and the capacity that that somebody has existing uh to maintain a budget and 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 fulfill a a year-long project um, thank you. So with that, I, we are, I, I'm going to re read all of these chat questions and messages, um, resources and tools, and um, thank everybody for their time for coming today. Thank you again to to our speakers and panelists and friends and colleagues uh, for 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 sharing um, their resources. And um, if there's any direct questions in the chat, I will respond to you via email. Um, so thank you again for everybody. Uh, again, and check out our, our website for our programs for our next upcoming activities and for the recording of, of today. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great day.